Coming up in this episode of Finding Common Ground. And Bill, I think he has helped erode trust in our system because of democracy. If you don't trust democracy, that's all we really have is trust. Well, voting is another issue they bring up, but the overriding rule is the Constitution. And we follow the Constitution. And if you don't agree with the Constitution, then you can, you can go out and change it. There are two sides to every coin. How do we deal with racial issues when they affect relationships? Finding common ground on all those issues that we come against. There's black and there's white. And I think as Christians, we have to learn how to get together because we're not in heaven. I've met more interesting people just by God just bringing them in. Republicans and Democrats. But a lot of times when it comes to race and it comes to culture and it comes to perception, even as Christians, we don't always understand. We look at it through our lenses. There's Bill. I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland called Parma. Uh, Any was the, black people in Parma? There was not one. Not one black person, not Bill? Not one. Come not on, Bill, one. you got to have one, a, a nope. token black person, a token. And there's Odell. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, public housing, single mom, divorced single mom with four kids, and I came up through segregation and all that kind of stuff. If a black person drove through the town, the police would stop and escort them out. Bill and Odell are finding common ground. A part of what we have to do is listen to each other, find the common ground, and question, not questioning you like you're on a witness stand, but questioning you for a better understanding. Father God, we just come to you just to say thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And God, just thanking you for the blood of Jesus that just covers us. God, in many of our lives, we have mountains. And we ask you, God, that if you don't move the mountains, then give us the strength to climb, God. If you choose not to move the mountains in our lives, God, we ask to give us the strength to climb them. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Lord, just uh, we lift up the mountain climbers that have climbed mountains for our freedom, mountains to eliminate racial issues, folks that have fought for civil rights. And thank you for all the brave people that teach our students and administrators that take care of our schools. Amen. So, Bill, we have a House of Representatives who it appears that we don't have leadership at this time. So, my friend, who's doing the people's business in the people's house? Uh, I think they're doing monkey business is what I think is going on. (laughs) The uh, unbelievable monkey business, monkey business. I tell you what, you know, if you were to write a script on how this Republican or even congressional thing happens, it's crazy. I've been listening to a lot of the commentaries and, uh, you know, Kevin McCarthy compromised his position and uh, allowed the folks that one vote could change and challenge him where before it had to be the leader of a party to wow. challenge him. And they said on, on the radio that I was listening to that Pelosi, when she was speaker of the other, not speaker, but uh, the other party, when somebody else was in speakership, Bannon, and I can't remember the other one's name, but uh, she went up to him and says, look, I'm your opposing party. I won't challenge you. Mm. Okay. And, uh, they don't know if, if Pelosi said the same thing to McCarthy when he came in their power. And she's right now at Diane Feinstein's funeral. Right. So they can't ask her. Right. But, you know, there's people stepping up. I heard Jim Jordan stepped up and said he wanted to do it. Scalise wanted to do it. He stepped up. Now, Scalise has uh, leukemia. Mm. So he's battling cancer of the blood. So I don't know how healthy he is. But uh, so, you know, they're, they're going to have some names come up. The thing is, the, the House is so split that I don't know if those eight people will come over and support either of those names or somebody else, but they hold the control. They hold the control unless the Democrats step in and uh, support somebody. Well, then when that happens, then all of a sudden, a lot of bells and whistles go off that a Democrat is supporting a Republican or a Republican is letting a Democrat come in. Well, do you think they're going to do it for a Coca-Cola? They're going to want to do it. They wanted some compromise on it. They're going to they're going to put their hand out and say, yeah, we'll give you those 20 votes that you need. But here's what it's going to cost you. And it's interesting if the 
Democrats support a Republican, should they be charged with party disloyalty? <laughs> huh? You know, I think a part of legislating is working together for the people concerning the people's business. So I think if you work together, that should not be party disloyalty. So my question is, no, sir, I do not think that that Democrat will be charged with party disloyalty. Well, do you? there's another question. If you're a citizen, not a public elected official, just a citizen, and you register as a Democrat, but you vote for either unaffiliated or Republican, is that party disloyalty? Well, I am just a citizen. I am a registered Democrat. I have voted for Republicans. I have endorsed Republicans. I have voted for Democrats and endorsed Democrats. My philosophy, sir, is I try to vote for the best candidate, the best person, not because they're Democrat or Republican. So I've never been charged with party disloyalty, but I have definitely been out there front and center endorsing and supporting Republicans in this city and in this state, sir. Okay, very good. You know, it's interesting in business when you have an opening in, in any position, whether it's someone working the assembly line or somebody in the executive office, you don't replace them because of a particular philosophy that they have or a particular D or R or anything like that. You hire the best person. And, uh, you know, we've kind of run in that in the scouts. The scouts have professional scouters that have spent their life training and working to become scout executives. Yes, sir. And uh, up until maybe four years ago, you were not allowed to put a non-professional scouter in an executive position in the Boy Scouts, whether it's at national or local. And they changed the bylaws to allow that so that you can, the theory was that they hired a person to get the Boy Scouts through their bankruptcy uh -huh. and uh, also to reorganize us. Okay. And they decided that, that really that gifts set was never trained by professional scouters. So they went outside and got a, a fellow that was a big volunteer with the Boy Scouts and the national board, but also ran a multi-billion dollar company and knew had been through stuff like that. And he ran it and he reduced our overhead and he got us through the bankruptcy. And now he's going to retire. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was asked to do this is, is to help the scouts through this difficult time. So now we're looking for a new CEO or chief scout executive. And I don't know if they're going to pick somebody that's outside the professional or inside the professional. We'll know sometime by the end of the year. But we had a chance to replace our scout executive here in our local council. I remember when I was on the committee to pick that person, I had never been through the process. So they had a person come in and he explained the process. And I said, well, we can only pick from this pool from the professional scouters. And at that time, they hadn't changed the bylaws. And he goes, yeah, that's that's the rules of the scouting. You can only pick from these people. I said, well, what happens if we had somebody that was locally that knew everybody, had mm -hmm. the great connections, could raise money? And may not know much about scouting, but could run a business and, and support us the way we want. Somebody like Nito Quibain. If you folks don't know who Nito is, look it up. He's raised billions of dollars for High Point University, and he's just a local businessman. I said, well, what happens if we asked Nito to do it and he wanted to do it? He said, we couldn't hire him. And I'm going, man, that is short-sighted. I said, this guy could turn us around in a Minnesota minute with his pinky. <laughs> and uh, I said, that doesn't make any sense. So they've changed the law. And recently they had a chance to put a scout executive in. They didn't even interview the non-professionals that were interested, which is very short-sighted and disappointing for me. So how does that apply to the Republicans and Democrats? I think that when you vote, you know, some people vote only D and only R. And right. that's they hit that button, D or R. I think you ought to look at who's most qualified because they're responsible. Now, they may not have all the philosophical items that you have, mm -hmm. and uh, but they may. And I think it's important to review what the platform is for each party and see if it fits 
with you. And I suspect 100% won't fit, but you have to go with the individual that you trust and you think will do a good job and be fair. Well, I, well, to answer a couple of your questions, as it relates to scouts, it looks like the people who were driving the car when the car ran amok, the professional people, I think mm -hmm. somebody was in charge doing the process, which led to the scouts being bankrupt and all other things that led toward that. Yep. According to what you said, they were professional scouters. OK, yes. so why put the people who run it amok back in charge or don't allow some differences? Yeah. As far as political parties, when you say that right now in Washington, D.C., in the people's house, no business is being done. Because I think according to the rules, you cannot do any official business if one does not have a speaker. Correct. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is what happens when small minded or small thinking individuals ascend to or by default find themselves in the big positions. Because a lot of times you could get to the big position, but you're not qualified for it. Mm -hmm. And the, the, just the whole idea and the pressure of being in the hot seat, it paralyzes certain people. So back to your point, when the whole scouting system was in bankruptcy, you need someone who's been in that position before or similar to come in and pull you out. When Kevin was Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy was buying, bidding, begging for the speakership. It took 15 times and he made some of these compromises in the process. Mm hmm. Now he's out on his behind and it's, it's really like, what's going on? Who's in charge? Because now is not enough for Odell to sit here and say, well, the Republicans have a circular firing squad and yada, yada, yada. That, that, no, that's no good anymore. Now as an American, Odell says, wait a minute, guys, come on now. Who's doing the business? And the thing about it, Bill, he got kicked out. I think like we used to say in South Carolina, the straw that broke the camel's back is that he did not dig deep and says, we're going to shut the country down. And I think that's one of the reasons, other than they said he wasn't always truthful, but then that's hard for Republicans because you have a leading candidate for presidency who, according to many, are not always truthful. So do we apply our principle selectively or is a principle a principle, sir? That's a great question. How do you apply it? You know, you were talking about the best person for the job. You know, I was thinking of how do I make that applicable? And I think it is you're going to get major surgery and the doctor comes in and said, I just got out of medical school. This is my first one or the guy that's done it 500 times. Okay. Well, I got to pick the young guy because he went to Duke and I'm a Dukey. I don't want the Carolina guy because even though he did all that stuff, I want a Dukey. It, it's silly. So that's kind of my, my thinking that when you get people, you know, we got to get the government to run. Now there's certain amount of friction that should happen. That's healthy. And uh, Claiborne was on today and he was talking about that. He said, you know, we're not designed to be all yes persons. That's uh -huh. not the way the government was designed. There's supposed to be friction between the executive committee, the two houses, the Supreme Court. But the overriding rule is the Constitution. And we follow the Constitution. And if you don't agree with the Constitution, then you can you can go out and change it. So Jim Claiborne. From South Carolina. Yes. He came on. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. And Interesting. He, and they said, uh, did uh, Speaker McCarthy keep all of his promises? He says, nobody keeps all their promises. He said, it's difficult to do that. He said, but there were some pretty significant things that we agreed to. Yes. And for example, when we were trying to work out a compromise on the budget and it failed, uh -huh. he said, the Democrats were the ones that came over. And we're in unison to try and fix this and had a couple of Republicans join us. Well, somehow this through a procedure thing, it failed. The Republicans did want it. And he said, McCarthy went on news next day and he said, the whole reason that we're not having a balanced budget was all the Democrats fault. Mm -hmm. And when he says, I know that's not true. He says, I was in the room. And uh, he said, so I'm calling him out on that. He said, because for that reason alone, there's many others. He said, I wouldn't support him for speaker. Wow. Wow. I met him. Did you uh, really? Yeah, I met him. Congressman Mark Walker 
uh, who's a Republican. I was there and we were in the back dealing with the speaker. It wasn't McCarthy at the time. It was uh, Banner. Speaker. Banner? Nope, not Banner. After Banner. Um, good guy. Mine slips me to come back to me. But I remember going in this little room. They got all these little chamber rooms there and going there and they were having lunch. And I, I met speaker. He was a speaker at the time, Kevin McCarthy. And it's just interesting when you look at it. He's just one of these guys, you know, he's just one of these guys, nothing special about them, but he's just one of these guys. And when he said to, I think it was Congressman Matt Gates, bring it on. And Gates is like, I just did. That's like schoolboy stuff, you oh, know, yeah, that's yeah. just like schoolboy stuff. And we're dealing with it. And now when they start talking about that motion to vacate, that's serious stuff, Bill, because this was never done before. I think it says what the House made a historic move to oust Kevin McCarthy as speaker. The first time a speaker was removed by his colleagues in wake of rebellion against the far right lawmakers, you know, and talk about the latest divide, the divide of the Republican Party. But we're not even going to beat up the Republican Party today because it's bigger than the Republican Party. It's the United States of America. And then the whole time, like the gentleman said, the congressman said, the Democrats, meanwhile, simply had zero desire to bail out McCarthy, who they viewed as a fundamental, dishonest and untrustworthy person. You know, Paul Ryan, it was Paul Speaker Ryan. Paul Ryan. Paul, Paul Ryan. Ryan, I remember yep. uh, being in meetings with Paul Ryan and we were talking about strategy and everything. And he was a, and still is a Republican, knowing I was a Democrat. And we were all around the table, we were around the table trying to make some things happen. Because sometimes, Bill, when leadership is afraid, things don't get done. And I saw Speaker Kevin McCarthy as a leader who was afraid. He was afraid of the people who he was leading. And I guess he had a good reason to be afraid of them. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, the people who he was leading end up doing him in. Yep. He set it up so that who in their right mind would say, yeah, one person that calls out could have the vote. I mean, you knew somebody was going to, that many people, somebody was going to call you out. I would have never compromised in that position, but he wanted to become speaker so bad. I think he was willing to give away anything. Well, I'm not going to say one will sell their soul because if I say that, I got to go back to my theme song. When the devil go down to Georgia looking for some votes to steal, <laughs> he was at a bind because he was way behind. So he had to make a deal. So we're not going to go there. But what I will say, when small minded or small thinking men and women ascend or by default end up in big, powerful positions, you see that they're not qualified to be in those positions. And I think that's when you start making deals to get in a position you're not qualified for or to stay in a position or a seat that's not yours. So he said, bring it on. Gates said it's coming. And we went from there. And again, when leadership is afraid, speaking of someone who's afraid, Bill, former President Donald Trump, usually he blows everything off and it's not a big deal. But guess what? He showed up in the courthouse and he, he showed said, up, showed up today, too. Yeah, that's what I said. He said they're trying to damage me. Trump said the New York civil fraud trial begins Manhattan courthouse, civil fraud cases. And guess what, Bill? He showed up in a blue suit as always, but he had on a blue shirt in a blue tie. So that 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 whole blue suit, white shirt, red tie is like, uh-uh, uh-uh. Wait a minute. Isn't blue the Democratic color? Hey, listen, listen. That's what I'm trying to say. Trump is like, wait, I got to change my colors. <laughs> I got to change my colors. You, you own a blue suit? Yeah, I own a blue suit. Do you? I don't. I yeah, don't. I own a blue suit. I, I have a red one. Coat. I have a red one. Okay, well, we, <laughs> you got you even have a chicken suit. I have a giant chicken outfit that I will. Oh, that's that. right. It's an outfit, not a suit. Yeah. But why do you think he showed up? Because push. We used to say in South Carolina, when push get come to shove. Mm -hmm. Well, I think with President Trump, former President Trump, ex President Trump, whatever you want to say, push is coming to shove now. Because when you start talking about fraud. And the possibility that they could bankrupt him and take all his assets. You think that's why all of a sudden he's showing up in court? Well, it might be. But, you know, here's the thing. What can he do by showing up in court to change the outcome? It's going to be about the facts. One of the things that's been interesting is all the rhetoric around all the stuff with Trump, all yeah. the drama, all the word calling, all the tweets, all that stuff. 
that's actually noise in the system. When you go to court, all that junk goes away and they go, show me the facts. Show me the facts. And they have a process. The legal process is pretty regimented in that you can't do hearsay. And that means if you told me something, I said, well, I heard it from Odell. No, I got to hear it firsthand. Mm. Go to the source. Okay. Because how do we know Odell was telling us the truth? And where did Odell hear it? Well, he heard it from another person. Where did they hear it? Well, from another person. I don't know if you've ever played that game where you give somebody yeah. a story. Yeah. And by the time it's done, you know, you start out with the dog went to the bathroom. When you're done, gr <laughs> grandma just made an apple pie. It's totally different. And it depends on your political slant. You know, if you start out that, you know, Disney is teaching wokeness and there's transsexuals walking under uh, playing Mickey Mouse and all, uh -huh. you know, people go crazy to make up stuff. So- the point is that Donald Trump can't make any change by sitting there, but he can make a huge change by talking and mouthing off. That's why lawyers tell their client, shut up. Don't say anything. I'll tell you when you're supposed to say something. And why are they so strict? Because they're mean and they don't want you to talk? No, they're protecting you from yourself because you can say something that's going to incriminate you. Bill, but it's Donald Trump. Donald Trump's in the courthouse giving people the mean mug look like he's trying to intimidate people. And it says the judge, the judge who oversee the trial accused, accusing former President Donald Trump and his company of fraud imposed a gag order after the former president posted a disparaging social media post about one of the judge's clerks. The gag order prohibits parties in the case, including but not limited to Trump, from posting, emailing or speaking publicly about members of the New York City court staff. And it appears that former President Donald Trump's number one target now is black females. Well, he's it, calling them everything it, from yeah. jigaboos to big boys. He's just going crazy, <laughs> crazy. just attacking yeah. black females. Why do you think he's doing that? Because I think that he's a racist. Uh, I'll tell you why he's doing it. He may be that, but I don't think so. I, I think he's doing it because he's playing to his base. So he's it's playing to his base. And and that's why he's showing up every day. And that's why he does a press conference every day. Why do you think he did those COVID things when he when COVID was, you know, getting up there and saying, is there some way we can, you know, get uh, bleach or something, some kind of killer and inject it in people and kill this virus? Uh -huh. I mean, stupid stuff. And instead of letting the professionals go up again it goes back to that thing of who do you want to operate on you i get it and is donald trump an expert on COVID? in his mind he was but there's other people that understand COVID, and so what he does he plants seeds the COVID shot is bad mm -hmm. COVID, you shouldn't do this you shouldn't wear a mask you shouldn't do this i'll tell you a story we were at a uh it's called the black mountain retreat it's up at uh billy graham's place uh-huh uh, I forgot the name of it up there, but we were up there and uh, it was just at the tail end of COVID. We hadn't gotten the shot yet. And they decided they were going to do the retreat. Mm -hmm. And the people I was with were not mask wearers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got up there and uh, we, we were ha having our, it was a Christian thing and it was a Republican thing and they just weren't going to wear masks. Some people were, some weren't, but for the most part, most people weren't. And uh, Billy Graham's grandson, Will Graham, who runs that place uh -huh. showed up and so i was talking to him he had a mask on i had a mask on we're talking and i mentioned that my uh wife's dory's mom was held by billy graham when she was a little kid and we had a picture of it and he said man i'd like to see that we've never seen pictures of dad back then so we made a copy and sent it to him and he was very thankful but what he was there for was to see if we were wearing masks or not because they asked us to wear them uh-huh and his staff was complaining that the people weren't wearing masks. So we got together for our prayer session and our worship session and our talking session in an auditorium. And Will Graham got up there and he goes, let me make it perfectly clear. We opened this up because we believe in you folks. But we also opened it up knowing that you would wear mask and follow protocol. Uh -huh. And my staff called me and said, you're not. So I came over here on a Saturday which is my day off to see. And sure enough, you're not wearing masks. So here's here's your option. You don't have to wear a mask, but you got to leave right now. Right, right. And if you wear a mask, you're welcome to stay. Are there any questions? 
and everybody put their mask on. And, you know, and to your point, how we started this off was former President Donald Trump. I say he's a racist. And it's like what he hollers is that everybody else is a racist. Everybody hates him. These judges, many of them happen to be black. He called them a racist. The white judges, he don't call them a racist. He, he, he picks on black women in from a perspective. But that's not enough, Bill, because at the end of the day, people can say anything they want to. And if Donald Trump with the indictments and it's like, oh, it's a witch hunt. They're trying to stop me. I didn't do anything wrong. You know, it's like, come on, man. We are tired and we're sick and tired. It's almost like you want to vomit some of this craziness that he's trying to feed you. And everybody's like, yeah, he's innocent. He's innocent. It's like, come on, guys. But let me tell you what's starting to happen. And you probably may know this or not. But like down in Georgia, you got Scott Graham. He's the bails bondman. You know, he did a plea deal. Five years probation, agreeing to testify and further proceedings. You know, you're looking at Bernard Kirkett is seeking immunity. He's one of Trump's guys who've been subpoenaed in Fulton County. And as he's a long time Trump confidence said, I need immunity. So these folks are starting to look out for themselves, Bill, because the bully out there is someone's talking Let me and ask doing you, all this. They're yeah. doing that. Should they be charged with party disloyalty? Oh, man, listen, you know, this is <laughs> party disloyalty is foolishness it in is. my mind. Yeah, well, let me go. I want to go back to something. Yeah. Trump's trial in New York is about him putting fraudulent claims on the value of his properties. I think that's that's the claim. Yes. That he filed false affidavits to get better loans. And I, I was with some folks yesterday and they said, Okay, let's say he let's let's assume he did it. Okay, who was harmed? He paid back the money he borrowed. Mm -hmm. He didn't go bankrupt. So who was harmed by him lying on the affidavit? Right. Who was harmed? The American public was harmed. And let me explain why. Because what people are trying to do is try to make excuses for President Trump. It's like, okay, that's the rule. He broke the rule. But you know, who cares? But then if somebody else break a rule, then all of a sudden the whole weight of the criminal justice system comes down on them. So who was harmed? Everybody know Donald Trump is a fraud because in some cases, Bill, when Forbes magazine talks about Donald Trump and the richest people in the world and all this kind of stuff, they <laughs> Forbes said they've been fighting with Trump for years on him trying to push his net worth. So who was harmed? I think American people was harmed. Who was harmed when he lied about the presidential election? And we had January 6th. Who was harmed in January 6th, Bill? Well, the same people say, oh, January 6th, no one was harmed. You know, who was harmed down in Georgia when a lot of these young ladies are being targeted that people, they can't even go outside because Trump said they were taking fraudulent votes out of a suitcase. Who was harmed? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Was I, was talk, I was talking to somebody, some guys yesterday. I was out and I was working on hunt camp and cleaning up deer stands. And we were talking about January 6th in the Trump rally on January 6th. And they said, you know, there was just a bad element that came there. And I said, well, who invited them? And it was during COVID. We hadn't gotten a shot yet. So why would you invite people to a large event, even though it was outside, where you could spread COVID? The other thing I, I pointed out is I don't remember before Trump got elected, that people would show up at a rally in combat outfits with helmets, bulletproof vest, camo, mace, ties. I don't remember people doing that. And let me tell you, I grew up in 1968 when we did the uh, Democratic Convention, where I just happened to be in town that day and got to see it. Okay. Yeah. I didn't see anybody when they were getting beat by the Chicago police like a drum. I didn't see people wearing combat outfits. I didn't see anything like that. And later on in life, even when we protested the Vietnam War, yeah, we might have said things, but we didn't show up in combat gear. And yeah, people might have thrown rocks, no doubt mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I went to the police station after that riot in Chicago. Reverend Like, who is my one of the guys from my high school, who ended up becoming Bishop of Atlanta, mm. his brother was assistant chief in the Chicago Police Department. So Reverend Lake said, hey, want to go see my brother? He's at Chicago Police. So he says, I'm going to go see him and have lunch with him, and he's going to give me a tour of the facility. So I said, yeah, I'd love to go. I was at the day before I was at the riots, so I 
curious to see their viewpoint. So we go over to the police station and it looks like a compound. There's cops all Mm -hmm. over the place running around. And his brother comes out. We go into his brother's office and his brother said, this is really not a good time for a tour. (laughs) Okay. He says, we are, you know, there's been a lot of serious things going on and we're trying to get things under control. But he said, I I will show you what we collected from these radicals. Mm -hmm. And they collected baseball bats with spikes drove through wow, them. Wow. Baseballs with spikes thrown through them. The Maltov cocktails that hadn't been lit. There was some bad element in there. Mm-hmm. So when you bring out radical groups, you're asking for trouble. Well, I, I agree. And back to the point of who, so what he lied on his paperwork, so what he did this, so nobody got harmed. You know, one of the things about the Forbes magazine, I read Forbes magazine, of course, and it talks about why do they keep tabs on the richest people in the world? No, that's a great question. And they said, Forbes said, one of the biggest investigative projects in all of business journalism is we dig so deep because great wealth mean great power. And it's crucial to understand who the richest people in the country are and how they make, spend, and donate their fortunes. I was sitting there thinking about what uh, the individuals that you were talking to said, okay, so what? No one got hurt. I think a lie and fraud ends up hurting someone. I think January 6th, people got hurt and I think people got killed. I think to your point of hang Mike Pence, Mike Pence didn't get hurt, but I think our country got weakened because I said American people, I think our country got weakened because of Donald Trump. I don't think Donald Trump being a leader, because when leadership's afraid or leadership's weak, I don't think Donald Trump, under Donald Trump's leadership over the last couple of years in and out of office, I don't think America is a stronger country with the Donald Trump element. But I might be different. Your thoughts. Maybe well, you say, oh, well, it is well, here's, stronger. Here's, I think here's, he's here's. weakened our system. And Bill, I think he has helped erode trust in our system because of democracy. If you don't trust democracy, that's all we really have is trust. Well, voting is another issue they bring up. Here's my thoughts on the fact that no one was harmed by him misleading. I don't think that's the point. I think the point is he lied. And if he lied on something like that, what else is he capable of lying on in misleading, in credibility? So if if he lied just to make himself look good, that he was worth more than he was, what else is he doing that he's lying about? Could it be an election? Could it be something else? Keeping documents because he thought he owned them? Listen, Trump's off the chain. Black folks say, we say he's off the chain, but at the point, at the end- I don't even think he ever had a chain. (laughs) Well, some would say Donald Trump has been privileged and he's been able to do things that a lot of people can't do. He's been accused of doing a lot of things that a lot of people would never even think about doing. But, Bill, you know, it's not just him. It's back to when small minded, small thinking men and women get into powerful positions. It shows Mm -hmm. it shows because President Trump, when he was president, he was sitting in the chair of the most powerful man or woman in the world, the president of the United States. He wasn't the most powerful. The position was the most powerful position. And I think he may have got confused with him as an individual and the position because it's not his seat. It's the people's seat. And a lot of times people look at it like it's the people's house, the Supreme Court, you know, the way that you mentioned earlier, the system is supposed to be give and take when the Supreme Court justices start deciding that they're going to have the rich, wealthy friends who can shake them either way. Or when the House Speaker House says, listen, we're going to shut down the whole government. If we don't get our way. Or if the Senate says, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Our system doesn't work. And I love this country too much to say it doesn't matter. Let's shut everything down and argue over it. It's not theirs to shut down. It's not theirs to shut down. It's not their government to destroy. It's we the people. 
It's not Donald Trump. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. It's not the independents unaffiliated. It's we the people. People have died for this democracy. And we have some 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 juvenile people in Washington right now who think it's all about them. It's not about them, Bill. It's not about them. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about we the people. We have to have a country for our kids, our grandkids, and our stuff to inherit. And we're messing it up, Bill. Bill, we're messing up democracy. Yeah, I, I can't agree with you. I think I trust the American people. I do. Unfortunately, the American people can't vote on every single little issue. I agree. So, so that's why we have representatives. But many times representatives, when they get into power, abuse that power. And uh, sometimes they abuse it for their party. Sometimes they abuse it for themselves. I mean, what do you think of, is it uh, Senator Mendez that happened to have gold bars and oh, all kinds of money in his pocket? And he said, you know, he he's did that just to keep himself safe and guess case uh, Cuba comes back again or something. I don't know. Democrat. He's a Democrat. He's a Democrat. And I think he said once I read, allegedly said that they're just picking on him because he's a Hispanic. See, see, that's what I'm saying. It's like the black card, the white card, the Hispanic card. Anytime we get caught, it's a card. You're just picking on me because I'm good looking slim and trim Odell. No, I'm <laughs> picking on you, Odell, because you got gold bars. You got a half a million dollars and your wife just got a brand new car when you pass this vote. And we got documents and tape recordings and all this stuff that you're doing wrong. But I'm like, no, not me. No, it's not me. And then all of a sudden Odell starts saying, but I know I lied, cheat and stealed. But who did I hurt? Yeah. I don't know. Just uh, shake your head. That's all I can say, man. Guess who's running for president, Bill? Who? California Governor Gavin Newsom. He hasn't announced. He hasn't announced. Really? He's going to run for, against Biden? He's going to run against Biden. Let me tell you why Odell thinks he's going to run against Biden. Because he just appointed Lavonza Butler to replace Democrat Senator Dianne Feinstein. And let me tell you who Butler was. She's the current president of Emily. She was the current president of Emily's List, a Democratic political action committee, better known as a PAC dedicated to electing pro-abortion Democrat women to the office. She's a black female and he appointed her. And my good friend, Senator Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, I'm not going to get on the Mitch bandwagon, y'all, expressed concerns over it. So if Mitch is like, I don't know about her, then she's my person. And it's just crazy when Newsom is saying, hey, let me start. Let me start lining up, you know, getting my ducks in a row because I'm going to challenge Biden for presidency. You heard it first here on Common Ground, Odell and Bill. So just remember, that's where you heard it first. Wow. Do you still believe that President Trump is going to be you all's candidate? You think he's going to make it out of the primary, Republican primary? If he can live that long. Yeah. What does that mean, sir? Well, you know, I feel sorry for the guy. I think he's very smart. He's got tremendous amount of things done through a bipartisan, but his physical, his body's breaking down. I mean, if you watch him walk, he's he's got the old man shuffle. So I think fortunately he's sharp right now, but that can change in a quick time. So then you say, okay, if, if he gets elected and something happens to him, then who becomes president? That's not going to be a question. President Trump is going to be indicted and he's going to be convicted. And he's going to jail. Hunter Biden is going to be indicted. And he's going to jail. So inside prison, President Trump will be the president of the prison and Hunter Biden will be the vice president of the prison. And we have bipartisan partnership in the prison system. But again, Joe Biden is going to pardon both of them. Well, I'm trying to figure out which one's going to have Bubba as his roommate. <laughs> You and Baba, you and Baba, you know, so it is what it is. So, again, as we move toward close, uh, former speaker Kevin McCarthy, you know, I hope, Bill, that it was worth it for him. All he went through, I hope it was worth it for him. But, you know, you, you do a lot of things. And I think you had you had an event, right? Yeah. Sylvia M Mendez, I yeah. think you were going oh, there. I Tell went, me about yeah. her. This is unbelievable. I went to, uh, it's called the Newcomer School, uh, Ribbon Cutting. It's in, It was in High Point. We have one in Greensboro. And what it is, is when people come in from outside the United States that maybe not speak English or things like that, that we send them, we can't put them in our regular population because they can't speak English. Uh -huh. And so we to help them get up to speed, 
we put them in a newcomer school. Makes and they, sense. They teach them English as a foreign language, some of our culture. English is a foreign language? Yeah, because they're from another country. So I, I, I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought Republicans and Democrats says nobody's coming across the border. The border is out of control. Are these individuals who came across the border? No, or? no, they they come through regular channels. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Thank you for clearing that and, out for me. And so I've visited the one here. In fact, that's where I met Chief Justice Paul Newby. Okay. He, he came in and explained to them how our legal system worked. Wow. And tried to get them to understand what the Constitution meant and all that. So we decided it was, it was bringing so many people in from foreign countries that we opened up a second one in High Point, and it's the Sylvia Mendez Newcomer School. Wow. The governor was there, and Sylvia was there, and and I hadn't heard of Sylvia. Okay. Uh, so shame on me, but she has received uh, from President Obama the Medal of Freedom recipient in 2011. She was a civil rights activist, but she was a school teacher and a nurse. Mm. I think a nurse maybe, and a school teacher maybe after that. And she was very timid. She, in 1943 in Winchester, California, she was students would go to Mexican schools. She was Mexican. Her mom was Mexican, and her dad was Puerto Rican. But they couldn't go to regular white schools, so they went. Wow. They went to Mexican schools. What, what year was this? Nineteen forty-three. I don't think black folks went to white schools either. They didn't. They didn't. And so she was in third grade, and she and her brother were detained, denied admission to a white school, and the Mendez family, along with other Latino, fought to integrate the school. Mm. Uh, they won a federal court in nineteen forty-six, and then again in nineteen forty-seven, helped make California the first state to end school se segregation. Seven years later, uh, Mendez's victory was significant enough that uh, Supreme Court went after Brown versus Board of Education. So she I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. I thought Brown versus Board of Education was, well, I know it wasn't the first one to help segregate schools, but yes. So she worked for 33 years as a nurse, a pediatric nurse, and uh, then she did some teaching and her people started saying, you need to go out and let people know about this. Wow. Because like you just said, you didn't know it. So here's here's the quote that was in the back of it. She was 10 years old. She said this to her mother. I said to my mother, Sylvia, her mom said this to her, Sylvia, don't you realize what we're fighting for? And she said, yes, so we can go to that beautiful school in Westminster that has a great playground. Mm. I get to go on a playground. We don't have one in our school. Her mom said, no, Sylvia, that's not why we're fighting. We're fighting because under God, we're all equal. You belong at that school just like everybody else belongs at that school. That's what we're fighting for. Wow. And that was a 10-year-old girl talking to her mom. And so when her mom was uh, elderly and Sylvia took care of her, her mom told her, Sylvia, you need to go out and spread the word of what we did and why we did it and w what's going on. So she flew down. I think she's living in Philadelphia or New York. And she flew down to this event. She spoke. Mm. And I don't know what her age is, but it's, she's, well, she was 10 years old and 43. She's 33. She's pretty old. Uh -huh. And uh, she started crying. Wow. Because we brought the kids out carrying their flags. Wow. There were 40 different countries. Wow. And they sang a song to the people. And uh, they spoke, a couple of kids spoke. And the school's a beautiful school named after her. And she, go, she started crying. She says, I never knew what a newcomer school was. I've never heard of it till today. Mm. So we explained what it was, and she goes, that's beautiful. And yet my name's on it. Bill, you know, the prayer was, God, if you choose not to move the mountains in our lives, then give us the strength to climb. Yes. Amen. Speaking of strength, how are you doing, my friend? You Because you're out there representing District 3. You're in the schools. You just, you I'm just, running. I'm you, running. You, you're, you're climbing. I love. You're it. climbing. You just, you just keep climbing. God giving you the strength you know, to climb. You know, my only, only concern is that the election should be coming sooner. <laughs> Why is that, my friend? Because I know I'm going to win. I know that people have a choice, and I'm look forward to serving again. And I enjoy, really enjoy going out and meeting new people, hearing their viewpoint. I was with a pastor in Stokesdale today, who took a trip. To Philmont, Scout Camp, you went there? Yeah, I went to Philmont. And, and he went on an interfaith trip with you in 2013? Yes, went to Israel. Yep. And yep. you baptized him and he baptized you. Yep, yep, and, and, yep. You know, it's In the Jordan, in the yep. Jordan River. River Jordan. Yep, so that's cold water, baby. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
And I uh, baptized you in the you River did, Jordan. You did. Yes, and, and yes. you remember what I said when I came up? Yes, hallelujah. <laughs> and I said, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. <laughs> and, uh, but, hey, man, it was cold. Whew. And anyhow, I was with him, and he told me a story. And these are great stories. This is why I like doing this. Okay. He said, you know, I took my son to Philmont after 33 years after I went out there. And he said, you know, when I went out there, I had just been, I was a young man. He said, and I got my ego and the pastor came and talked to me and asked me to come into the ministry. And I wasn't too keen on that. He said, but when I went out to Philmont, I had time to myself and nature and God put it into my heart to become a minister. And that's what I did. Wow. And I got to take my son out there to the spot I made the decision. To follow God and become a minister. Yeah. You know what? Speaking of following God and one's personal ministry, you've never stopped representing District 3. No, no. It's my district. It's my district. And uh, I did, uh, I was at Dudley School the other day. That's not my district, but I wanted to go and support. You know, we had a shooting. Uh huh. And uh, I wanted to go find out what was going on. So I spent time there. And even even the school board people that know me, Come up to me and go, keep going, keep going. Well, speaking of just resilience and the whole thing with the youth resilience, what's going on with that conference? Ah, November 16th, we're holding one in Raleigh. Starts about eight o'clock in the morning, goes to about two, we'll feed you. And uh, Jim Jim has put that in. If you want to sign up, go to youthofnc.org or .com. Either one will get you there. And you can sign up and attend. You can do it via Zoom or you can do it, uh, come and visit us in Raleigh. I think we're going to have some of the speakers like we did last time yeah. talk. Jim's going to set it up for us, so we should be able to do that. Well, how does someone want to donate? Because you said you're running, mm -hmm. not as a Democrat, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. how does one who wants to find out more about you and how do they support you? Do you have to live in District 3 to support you? No, no. And you can, you can live in... Uh, California, <laughs> foreign country. <laughs> Be careful. You don't want to get caught with party disloyalty for saying someone out of District 3 can support you and yeah. all that kind of so stuff. So here's my website. It's called Gobel, G-O-E-B-E-L-N-C, like North Carolina, dot com. And you can go there and you can donate. We've raised almost $10,000 and our goal is 50. And it's uh, I'm a common sense conservative Republican that uh, is compassionate. So. A common sense conservative Republican who's compassionate and who wants to keep the main thing, the main thing, who God has put certain mountains in your path, but has given you the strength to climb. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Love you. Love you, too. Find Bill and Odell online at thecommonground.show. This podcast is a production of BG Ad Group. All rights reserved. This podcast is brought to you by Yes Weekly, the triad's largest circulated and best read weekly magazine. You can also find us online at yesweekly.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Yes Weekly, your trusted news leader for local arts, entertainment, music, food, and more for nearly 18 years. Whether you're a big, medium, or small business, managing and growing the bottom line is important. Focus CFO brings the experience and financial acumen of a Fortune 100 chief financial officer to your company at a fraction of the cost. PNL help, internal reporting processes, or any business transitions or events. Focus CFO will help you and your team have a CFO in your company's back pocket. Focus CFO. Learn more at focuscfo.com.